Welcome to Radio Intifada, Voices from Calcutta to Casablanca, Voices of Struggle, Voices for Change. We are broadcasting on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 in Santa Barbara, and streaming live at www.kpfk.org. I'm Hagit Burir. There's little question in anybody's mind of the special relationship between Israel and the United States. Israel is the largest recipient of American foreign aid to the tune of more than $3 billion a year, plus miscellaneous additional aid in surplus weaponry, debt waivers, and other perks. Israel is the only country that receives its entire aid in the beginning of the fiscal year, allowing it to accrue interest on it during the year. It's the only country that is allowed to spend up to 25% of its aid outside the United States, placing such expenditures outside U.S. control. Apart from financial support, the United States had offered unwavering support for the Israeli occupation and for the ongoing oppression of the Palestinians and has systematically cooperated with Israel's refusal to enter any effective peace negotiations or peace agreements. It has vetoed countless UN resolutions seeking to condemn Israel and to bring it into compliance with international law. It has allowed Israel to develop nuclear weapons and not to sign the Anti-Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. And most recently, it strongly supported Israel's attack on Lebanon in July of 2006. Support for Israel cuts across party lines and is extremely strong in Congress, where criticism of Israel is rarely, if ever, heard. It also characterizes almost all American administrations from Johnson onwards, with George W. Bush being possibly the most pro-Israeli president ever. What is the reason for this strong support? Opinions on this matter vary greatly. Within strong pro-Israeli circles, one often hears that the reason is primarily moral. The debt that the United States owes Israel in the aftermath of the Holocaust, the nature of Israel as the sole democracy in the Middle East, Israel as a moral and possibly strategic ally of the United States in its war on terror. Within circles that are less supportive of Israel and which are less inclined to view Israel and Israel's conduct as moral, opinions vary as well. One perspective is that the U.S. support of Israel stems from Israel being a strategic asset to the United States. Its support is simply payment for services rendered, coupled with the stable pro-American stance of the Jewish-Israeli population. Noam Chomsky, among others, is a proponent of this view. According to the opposing view, United States support for Israel does not advance American foreign policy aims. It jeopardizes them. The explanation for the support is to be found in the activities of the Israel lobby, also known as the Jewish lobby or as APAC, the America-Israel Public Affairs Committee, which uses its formidable influence to shape American foreign policy in accordance with Israeli interests. This perspective has most recently been associated with an article in the London Book Review authored by Professor Mearsheimer of Chicago University and Professor Walt of Harvard University. This debate is the topic of our program today. Let me introduce our guests. Norman Finkelstein is a professor of political science at DePaul University. Welcome to our program, Norman. Norman? Uh, I'm here. Okay. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Uh, Professor Finkelstein is uh, the author of a number of books and articles on the history of Zionism and on the role of Holocaust in Israeli present-day policies. His latest book, published in 2005, is Beyond Chutzpah, on the misuse of anti-Semitism and the abuse of history. Our second guest is James Petras. James is an emeritus professor of sociology at SUNY Binghamton. Welcome to our program, James. Glad to be here, Hagit. Okay. Professor Petras is the author of numerous books and articles on the making of state power and globalization in the context of the U.S. and Latin America, and most recently in the Middle East. His latest book, published in 2006, is titled The Power of Israel in the United States. Uh, perhaps starting with you, James, maybe you could tell us just by way of a short opening statement where you would place yourself on this issue of a debate on the source of the United States lasting and, and enduring support of Israel. Well, I think I would strongly uh, argue that the uh, pro-Israel lobby, the Zionist lobby, is the dominant factor uh, 
in shaping U.S. policy, uh, particularly in the most recent period. And I think one has to look at this beyond APAC. I mean, we have to look at a whole string of uh, pro-Zionist think tanks from the American Enterprise Institute on down, and then we have to look at a whole power configuration which not only involves APEC, but the president of the major American Jewish organizations, which number 52. We have to look at individuals occupying crucial positions in the government, as we had recently with uh, Elliot Abrams and uh, Wolfowitz and Douglas Fife and others. Uh, we have to look at the army of op-ed writers who have access to the major newspapers. Uh, we have to look at the super-rich contributors to the Democratic Party, media moguls, etc. And I think this, uh, together with uh, the leverage in Congress and in the executive, uh, is the decisive factor in shaping U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, and I, I uh, want to James, just just that. to to stop you, and maybe we can also have some kind of an opening statement from Norman. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for having me. You're uh, welcome. I would say I situate myself on the spectrum, somewhere towards the middle. I don't think it's just the lobby which determines the U.S. relationship with Israel. And I don't think it's U.S. interests that just determine the U.S. relationship with Israel. I think that you have to look at the broad picture, and then you have to look at the local picture. On the broad picture, that is to say, U.S. policy in the Middle East, generally speaking, the historical connection between the U.S. and Israel has been based on the useful services that Israel has performed for the United States in the region as a whole. And that became most prominent in June 1967 when Israel knocked out the main challenge or potential challenge to U.S. dominance in the region, namely uh, Abdel Nasser of Egypt. So on the broad question of U.S of the U.S.-Israel relationship, but as the regional relationship, I think it's correct to say that the, the alliance has been based fundamentally on services rendered. On the other hand, it's very clear from looking at the documentary record, just as it's clear from looking at the documentary record, that the U.S. was euphoric when Israel knocked out uh, Egypt, or knocked out uh, Nasser, Nasserism, it's also clear from looking at the documentary record that the United States has never had any big stake in trying to maintain Israel's control over the territories it conquered in the June 1967 war. That is to say, the Egyptian Sinai, the Syrian Golan Heights, and at that time, the Jordanian West Bank and Jerusalem. The U.S. clearly had no stake in it, and from very early, already from July 1967, wanted to apply pressures on Israel to commit itself to fully withdrawing. And it was pretty obvious, if you look at the record again, that Israel at that point was able to bring to bear the lobby in 1967-68. It meant principally the forthcoming presidential election and the Jewish vote. It was able to bring to bear the power of the Jewish vote to resist efforts to withdraw. And since 67, uh, the lobby has been very effective, I think in raising the threshold before the U.S. is willing to act and force an Israeli withdrawal, pretty much like the withdrawal it forced on Indonesia in 2000 to leave Timor, 
the two occupations begin roughly in the same period. Uh, 1974, okay. Indonesia invades Timor with the U.S. green light. 67, Israel conquers the West Bank, Gaza, and so forth with the U.S. green light. And so the obvious question is, both occupations endured for a long period. The Indonesian occupation was infinitely more destructive. It killed about one-third of the East Timorese population. But it's true to say, come 2000, the U.S. does order t Indonesia to withdraw its troops. Uh, and why uh, hasn't it done so in the case of the Israel-Palestine occupation? And there, I think, it's true to say it's the lobby. Okay. Uh, I think maybe we want to... Uh, uh, I have a feeling that one of the things that we really need to start with when we uh, try to address this issue is uh, what is it that we recognize, if we could recognize, and on, on more or less a global level, as American interests, such that we can say that they have, to some degree, systematically characterized different administrations, because it seems to me it would be very, very difficult to evaluate to what extent uh, policies that are going on with respect to Israel are or aren't uh, uh, compatible with American interests if we don't uh, talk a little bit about what we perceive to be American interest. So, James, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yes, I would. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, on that question, we have to be clear that if we're talking about the U.S. government and corporate interests in the Middle East in particular, or if we're talking about what should be. No, let, let's talk about what, what what they are, as what, right. what, what the aims of, let's say, various US, administrations are, as opposed to, let's US say, what policy. is in the best interest of either the American or the Israeli people, which may be very different. Very good. All right. Uh, on that count, I think it's very clear U.S. policy is directed toward empire building, extending its political, economic, and military control uh, over the world as a whole, and in particular in the Middle East. And it pursues that policy either through military means or through market mechanisms, such as the expansion of corporation, uh, the capturing of uh, pliant client regimes, uh, etc. And if we look at the uh, Middle East in particular, the U.S. has uh, been very successful in securing agreements with most of the oil-producing countries except Iraq and Iran, and even there, it's mainly because of its own uh, rejection of relations with both those countries. U.S. oil companies uh, have done extremely well through non-military means. They have uh, expanded their commercial ties, Goldman Sachs, has just signed a big agreement with the uh, biggest Saudi bank. Uh, Britain is organizing a secondary market in Islamic bonds. You, Wall Street is very interested in that. Uh, none of the oil companies supported a war in Iraq, uh, and this is part of the rubbish that's been peddled, that the war was about oil. The oil companies were doing fabulous uh, before the war and were very, very nervous about getting involved in a war. Th this, I think, leads us to the whole question of why then, if it was prejudicial to the major U.S. economic interests. Uh, as we can see, there were many military people even that were opposed to going into Iraq because they felt it would prejudice the U.S. overall uh, military capacities to defend the empire, just like the war in Vietnam prejudiced the capacity of the U.S. to intervene in Central America against the Sandinistas, against the overthrow of the Shah, etc. So from the point of view of global imperial interests, the... Uh, War in Iraq was certainly not on the behest of the oil companies. I've looked at all the documents. Uh, I've done interviews with oil companies. I've looked at their publications. 
for the five years in the run-up to the war, and there's absolutely no evidence. On the contrary, if you pursue research on the various members of the Zionist power configuration in the United States, which I think is a conceptually more correct way of talking about this rather than the lobby, uh, you will find that people of dubious loyalties like Wolfowitz, Feith, uh, Pearl, uh, Elliot Abrams, the felon, uh, that had a agenda of furthering Israel interests. Uh, uh, James, um, maybe we should uh, uh, um, sort of uh, go on with this. So, so, so basically, if I understand what you're saying, is uh, you're suggesting that, in fact, up to the point of getting involved militarily with Iraq, uh, you would characterize American policies in the Middle East, you know, the lobby notwithstanding, as extremely successful. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, it's what we call uh, market yeah. imperialism. Yeah. Uh, Norman, you want to comment on this? Well, you have to look at the interests at many different levels. And unfortunately, it becomes murky and complicated. Uh, where one would prefer a simple picture, I don't think it's all that simple when you try to figure it out. Number one, you have to look at the interests in terms of who's defining them. And I agree, I think it's fairly obvious, certainly to your listenership, that there are different interests if they're being defined by corporate power or if they're being defined dem uh, democratically by the desires and uh, choices of uh, ordinary people in a democratic system. So let's limit ourselves to first the question of the corporate interests because obviously they're playing the dominant role in determining U.S. policy, or it should be obvious, not always is. Let's uh, assume it is fairly obvious. <laughs> they're playing the determinant role. Then you have to look at okay, how do they conceive the best way to preserve and expand their interests? Now, the way they perceive it may seem to a person like you and me, it may seem irrational that they're pursuing policies which are actually hurting them. But the fact that they may seem irrational to us does not mean that those are the way they perceive the best way to preserve their interests. So if you take the concrete case at hand, it may be the case that it was irrational for the U.S. to go into Iraq because there are other ways to control the oil, or as some people have argued, that the market mechanisms are such that, on a world scale, the market mechanisms are such that you no longer need to control a natural resource in order to make sure you get the lowest price or make sure it's flowing at the lowest price. Control isn't all that important anymore in the modern world. It's not like when Lenin was writing his imperialism. Now, that may be rationally correct. And maybe there's a good argument for making it. But that doesn't mean that those in power aren't making, the, aren't making decisions to further their own interests, which may seem irrational to us. Uh, and in the case of Iraq, if you look concretely at what happens, number one, uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that people like Wolfowitz or the others were trying to further an Israeli agenda. There what would no be the Israeli agenda? I mean, Excuse actually, me? let me interrupt. What would be the Israeli well, agenda there, if there was one? There was, There is an Israeli agenda, and I'm not disputing it. The Israeli agenda is basically the following. Israel does not care which country you smash up in the Middle East just so long as every few years and sometimes every few months you smash up this or that Arab country to send a lesson or to transmit the message to the Middle East that we're in charge and whenever you get out of line, we are going to take out the big club and break your skull. 
Now, it happens that in the late 1990s, Israel would have preferred if the skull that was cracked was the Iranian one. There was no evidence that Iraq was uppermost on the Israeli agenda. In fact, all of this talk about the famous document that was written up by these neocons to attack Iraq, that famous document was handed to Netanyahu when he came to office to try to convince him to put Iraq at the top of the agenda. It's not as if Israel passed that document to the neocons who then plotted to get the U.S. government to attack Iraq. It was the opposite. Israel would have preferred to attack Iran. However, once those in our government, maybe for misguided reasons for all I know, decided to fasten on to Iraq, that is, to attack Iraq, Israel was, of course, gung-ho, because Israel is always gung-ho about smashing up this or that Arab country. That's always been its policy for the last hundred years. Since the beginning of Zionism, the most commonplace, the, most, the, the cliche of Israeli power is the Arabs only understand the language of force. So when the U.S. embarked on its campaign against Iraq, the Israelis were gleeful, but they're always gleeful. It doesn't mean that the people like Wolfowitz, let alone people like Cheney, are trying to serve an Israeli agenda. There's no evidence for claims like that. It's pure speculation based on things like ethnicity. Let's take a simple example, the one that, uh, uh, I'll call him James. I don't usually call people by the first name, but let's just call it James Jim Petras mentioned. Let's take the case of Elliot Abrams. These are interesting cases. Elliot Abrams is the son-in-law of Norman Podhoritz. And Norman Podhoritz was the first big neoconservative supporter of Israel, the editor of Commentary magazine. But if you look at people like Podhoritz, you look at their history. I'll take a book with, I'm sure, which I'm sure Jim is familiar with. In 1967, Pod Horowitz publishes his famous memoir called Making It. It's how he succeeded and made it in American life. He's a young man. He's the editor of Commentary magazine. You read that book, his celebrated memoir. It's written literally two months before the June 1967 war. There is exactly one half of one sentence in the whole book on Israel. People like Podhoritz, Midge Dechter, all the neocons. I have gone through the whole literature on the topic. I've read it quite carefully. Before June 1967, they didn't give a hoot about Israel. Israel never comes up in any of their memoirs, any of the histories of the period. They become pro-Israel when Israel is useful useful to them in their pursuit of power and fortune in the United States. Elliot Abrams is as committed to Israel as his father-in-law, Norman Podhoritz, was committed to Israel, when it's convenient and when it's useful. But this idea of trying to serve an Israeli agenda, especially coming from somebody like, as sophisticated as Jim Petrus, strikes me as absurd. Uh, no, Norman, knows, maybe we should uh, oh, move to Jim finish. at this point. He knows as well as I do. <laughs> their I power... It's strange they, that they, one says Wolfowitz was not in, influenced by the Israeli agenda when he was caught passing documents to Israel in the 80s. Douglas Fife lost his security clearance for hand, handing uh, documents to Israel. Elliot Abrams has written a book uh, calling for the purity of the Jewish. I know they they write that crap, and, and, and you believe them? I Jim, I'm, you think it, you it's think not they a care? Question of believing them is looking at the documentary uh -huh. evidence of uncritical support uh, 
for Israel in all of its policies, a, a, a position that's taken by the presidents of the major Jewish organizations in the United States. Uh, let, let, me, let me maybe interject here a little bit. Support. Let, let me perhaps interject here a little bit. Uh, uh, I think that uh, that uh, there, there are a couple of things. One is uh, I'm wondering, for instance, I don't know whether you would agree, James, with the particular Israeli interest that Norman had identified with respect to the invasion of Iraq. But uh, assuming that you would agree that the, in the Israeli interest is precisely that, namely uh, smashing some Arab country every once in a while because it's a good idea, no, uh, the question is whether that also hasn't been an American interest. So we have seen America go after countries which are sometimes, in terms of their power, otherwise are really quite negligible, just so as to make a point that anybody who dares to stand up to American uh, power is just a bad example and needs I to totally be smashed. Agree with that. Israel was running guns to Iran as late as 1987 and in the infamous Iran Contra scandal to say that they weren't interested in destroying Iraq as a challenge to its hegemony and Iraq's support for the Palestinians, particularly funding the families of assassinated Palestinian leaders. That's absurd. And I think oh, look, that, and uh, I think actually, could I, could I stop that. you at this particular point uh, because well, we need I'm to take a station you. break. So please, uh, please hold on to this particular thought and we will come back to it. Hi, this is Shay Popovich, actor and activist with Neighbors for Peace and Justice, San Fernando Valley. And I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host of KPFK's morning show, Uprising. We invite you to The Unembedded Truth, an evening with independent journalist Darja Mail. From Bechtel's failure to repair Iraq's water treatment plants to the silent tragedy of the widows, Darja Mail's stories about those most affected by the U.S. occupation, the innocent civilians, are covered by the BBC and the world press, in this country only by alternative media. On February 17th in Studio City, Darja Mail will be making a rare appearance to present an update with slideshow of the current conditions in Iraq and to share with us his assessment of future U.S. plans for the Middle East. That's Saturday, February 17th. 17th at 7 p.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Studio City, 12355 Moore Park Street. For more information, call 818-762-6695. That's 818-762-6695 or visit kpfk.org. KPFK is a media sponsor. Welcome back. You're listening to Radio Intifada on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 in Santa Barbara, and streaming live at www.kpfk.org. I'm Hagit Boreo. Our guests today are Professor Norman Finkelstein and Professor James Petras, and we are discussing the role of the Israeli lobby in shaping American foreign policy and in creating consent for those policies. Welcome back, Norman and James. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Haggit. Uh, I actually wanted... Haggit, it's all right. That's okay, yes, absolutely. Uh, at this point, I thought maybe we can uh, try to shift the topic a little bit and uh, well, can perhaps... Can I finish my last comment? Yes, please this? do. I think when uh, the, uh, the Pentagon offices are flooded like a, a crowded bordello on Saturday night with the Israeli intelligence offices, uh, crowding out even uh, members of their own Pentagon, full of Mossad, full of Israeli generals, in the making of Iraq policy. I don't think you can say that this is just any old Pentagon officials. I think you can't dismiss the fact that Feith, Wolfowitz, Elliot Abrams have a lifetime commitment to putting Israel's interest as their prime consideration in the Middle East. And I think this is absurd to think that somehow these just happen to be right-wing uh, right policymakers that happen to support a militarist policy. Wolfowitz designed the program. Uh, Fife put together the, uh, the special policy board that fabricated the in, uh, information for the Iraq war. They were constantly consulting on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis 
with the Israeli government. This has absolutely been documented a hundred times, and I think it's impossible to deny this and say, well, it's just you can't deduce policy from ethnic affiliations. Yes, you can when that ethnic group puts forward a position that puts the primacy on a foreign government at the center of their foreign policy and prejudices the lives of thousands of Americans, its economic interests in the air, and just say, these are a bunch of irrational policy makers. Uh, James, uh, um, uh, actually, let me pursue this and actually go into a slightly different point, and that is, uh, wouldn't it be possible, you know, that's a question for both of you, wouldn't it be possible, for instance, to think about um, whatever the neocon group is, as the group that, it's not a group that represents Israeli interests. It's a group that represents interests which happen to perhaps coincide for both countries and which represent alliances of particular politicians of both countries with one another and particular power configurations in both countries with one another, but not by any means all Israeli politicians or all Israeli power structure or all American politicians or Absolutely. all American power structures. Absolutely. There so in that no case, these are not really American interests. These well. are just interests of a particular group of people which is just as interested in bringing them to effect in the United States as it is in Israel. It's just basically, if you wish a wonderful symbiotic relationship. What would you say, Norman, to something like that, let's say? I, I've said, you know, in my uh, remarks at the beginning, there is an overlapping of interests on a regional level for reasons which, in part, you yourself suggested earlier. You said that the United States often goes after weak regimes as a kind of demonstration effect of its power and Israel also has a desire for <clears throat> demonstrating its power, and often there is, as I said, an overlapping or confluence of interests. I think, however, it's also true to say on the specific question of the occupation, there is a conflict of interests. And were there, a re were there not a lobby it's quite likely that the U.S. would have exerted uh, the kinds of pressure which are needed to force an Israeli withdrawal. But on questions like Iraq and Iran, I don't see any evidence whatsoever that it's being driven by cloak-and-dagger uh, type uh, operations in the Pentagon. These operations which Jim mentions are so trivial next to the very high-level planning that goes on between the United States and Israel, conscious, legal, high-level planning that goes on between Israel and the United States on a daily basis. High-level planning and high-level coordination. You don't have to conjure up cloak-and-dagger tales, many of them true, cloak-and-dagger tales going on inside the Pentagon in order to demonstrate that there is collusion, planning, and coordination between the U.S. and Israel. The question is not whether that goes on. The question is whose interests are being served by it. And this notion that somehow they are managing to distort, to deform uh, U.S. policy in a crucial region on a crucial resource uh, 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 doesn't, in my opinion, have any basis in fact. And it defies any kind of reason, any kind of commonsensical reasoning, especially coming from, in my youth, I used to be a student of James Petras at SUNY Binghamton, 1971 uh, to 74, and he used to be, I think, a Marxist, and at that time he would tell you how people in power act from interests which spring from what uh, they, they act on the basis of the interests uh, in which they are the ones who are the main beneficiaries. Uh, no, Cheney, Norman, let me uh, ask wait, 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 you. Uh, one second. Mr. Wolfowitz, 
I'm, I'm Mr. Mr. Wolfowitz, Mr. Feist, and all the others, their power yes. springs from the American state. If Israel gets stronger, their power does not increase. If the United States gets weaker, their power decreases. So now we're having this weird phenomenon of people due to their ethnic loyalties are willing to strengthen another state and weaken the sources of power from which their power comes. That doesn't sound it's believable. Kind of con convoluted thinking. I I'm sure Norman <laughs> didn't take that logic from my classes. <laughs> I'm afraid he's gone off the track somewhere. Despite some very good books he's written on the uh, Zionist shakedowns on the Holocaust <laughs> and the refutation of the plagiarism of uh, of uh, Dershowitz, I'm afraid when it comes to dealing with the predominantly Jewish lobby, he has a certain blind spot, which is understandable in many other national and ethnic groups where they can criticize the world, but when it comes to identifying the power and malfeasance okay. of their uh, own group... I, I, let, I let think maybe we should all... Nothing, uh, okay. nothing <laughs> cloak and dagger... About no, I know, the but le perhaps of, we can move away from uh, this specific well, let, let topic, just okay? This one sentence, okay? There's nothing cloak and dagger about the multiplicity of pro-Israel groups that have pressured Congress, that are involved in the executive body in shaping American policy in the Middle East. The U.S. does not support any other colonial power has opposed colonial occupation imperialism since World War II. They, they opposed the Suez in 56, 55. They have been pushing these countries, Europe and other countries, out in order to establish U.S. hegemony through economic and military agreements. So the Israeli is very different from the policies the U.S. follows everywhere else in the world. It's uh, the only country that gets $3 billion a year for 30 years. So I this agree is with not that. Just, this is not just something that happens because of cloak and dagger. This is the result as Norman knows as a very brilliant analyst, from organized power, an organized power that openly admits and states, and its, and its groupies state very explicitly that Israel is their major concern, and what's good for Israel is good for the United States. They say that, Norman. I know they say okay, that. Okay, uh, let, let, let me interrupt you say. because I need to do a station ID, and maybe we could uh, change a topic after that. Okay, Norman. Uh, you're, listening to mine. you're listening to Radio Intifada on KPFK. We are broadcasting on 90.7 in Los Angeles. Uh, we are talking to Professors Norman Finkelstein and James Petrus about the role of the Jewish lobby. And I think that we can at this point agree that you guys have a lot of mutual respect for each other, but also obviously you do not agree on some topics. And I wanted to move on to the question of whether there are, and I think this is a crucial case, and that is that whether there are in fact cases that uh, uh, show that when the, the conf that there are really issues, which presumably there, there would be, uh, uh, where there are conflicts of interest between the United States and, and Israel, that the United States does in fact, uh, let's say, pressure Israel, at least in some cases, to act in ways which are against uh, uh, what Israeli wishes would be. Because it seems to me that uh, uh, if we don't find cases uh, along these lines, then basically the discussion becomes um, kind of in the eyes of the beholder. You know, we see, uh, 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 certainly we see a lot of cooperation, a lot of joint interests, but they could be coming from either way, either side. It's the cases where uh, there is perhaps a, a, um, uh, where the interests part ways and, and, uh, and, and, and where we can see, in fact, that uh, that there is a discord that we can talk about this. So, um, uh, Norman, since you are the one who believes that this is, in fact, a possible thing, could you 
Could you talk about that? Well, the thing is, I don't want to make the argument that these kinds of individual cases can prove one side or the other. You pick up a book by uh, Steve Zunis, and he's going to demonstrate that the U.S. government always gets his way. You pick up something by somebody on the other side, and they're going to demonstrate that it's Israel that always gets its way when there are conflicts of interest. And each side can give a list of examples to demonstrate his or her case. And I don't think you can prove anything by citing a handful of cases on one side. Professor Chomsky will cite the recent case where Israel was severely reprimanded by Bush for trying to sell technology to China. And then you'll find cases on the other side. Uh, even though it's, of course, important to look at the empirical record, I don't think the empirical record in and of itself resolves the question. Let me give you a couple of examples of how I think it works. Let's take two prime examples. Let's start with 1948. Why did Israel recognize, excuse me, why did President Truman recognize Israel? There's all sorts of debate about that question. One claim that's constantly made was, is, that it was the Jewish lobby, namely Truman was heading for election and wanted in particular the New York vote, and the Democratic Party wanted Jewish money. And it was due to the Jewish lobby of its time that Truman quickly recognized Israel, even though he was bound to alienate Arab interests, which were hostile, very hostile to Israel's founding. What does the record show? I've gone through the record very carefully. The record shows as follows. Number one, our main interest at that time was in Saudi oil. And the U.S. enters into discussions with the Saudis. What will you allow the U.S. government to do regarding the founding of the State of Israel. And the Saudis basically say the following. We will let you recognize Israel, but if you supply arms, then there's going to be trouble, arms after Israel is founded and the imminent war. What does the U.S. do? It recognizes Israel, that is to say, it goes the limit, Truman goes the limit because he wants that Jewish vote and he wants Jewish money, but he immediately slaps an arms embargo on the region. And Secretary of State Marshall at the time says, it looks like Israel is going to lose the war. That's what our intelligence told us. We were wrong. But that's what U.S. intelligence said at the time. So, they were willing to let Israel be annihilated, because that's what our intelligence told us, if, if the price was losing the support of the Saudis. It is true, Le Truman went the limit. The limit was recognizing Israel to get the Jewish vote. But he never went beyond the limit of alienating a prime U.S. interest in the region, namely the Saudis. Let's take 1956, which Pet uh, Jim mentioned, but I don't think he knows what happened. In 1956, it's true. The United States told Britain, France, and Israel they have to get out of Egypt. And it's true, we looked very anti-colonial. But the only reason the United States did that was because the British, the French, and the Israelis acted behind the back of the United States. The very moment, the very moment, the tripartite invasion of Egypt occurred, 
the U.S. was plotting to overthrow the government of Syria at that very moment. And the U.S. wanted to knock out Nasser, but they didn't like the timing, because the timing was not the U.S. choosing, it was the British, French, and Israelis behind our backs. Once again, it was the U.S. interest that determined U.S. policy, not any commitment to anti-colonialism or crap like that. It was the U.S. interest. He's had five minutes already. I demand equal time. Okay. Please go ahead, James. You're right. Okay. He's been giving us long lectures. That's okay, oh, James. Oh, Please oh. just go ahead. Yes. If you look at U.S. policy to Israel, we alienate practically the whole world in favor of a tiny country which has virtually no economic value to the United States, is a diplomatic albatross, and has its own hegemonic military political interests in dominating the Middle East. We go into the United Nations, we alienate the whole of Europe, the Third World, when Israel destroys Jenin, when it engages in genocidal policies in the uh, occupied territories, it violates the Geneva Agreements. The U.S. backs it and totally discredits itself to anyone seriously concerned with international law, with the niceties of international relations. I'm not just talking about Muslim opinion, Arab opinion. I'm talking about world opinion. Secondly, to say that the United States overlapping interests with Israel is totally off the wall. I mean, I don't know where Norman's head is. The United States gets involved in countries to set up neo-colonial regimes. They're not into occupying and setting up colonial governments. They prefer local clients. And they had one in Lebanon with the president, Sonoria, who was receiving U.S. backing when Israel attacks Lebanon, presumably to attack Hezbollah, totally undermines the U.S. puppet. Is that in U.S. interest? Yes. And when you talk about the fact that Israel is taking measures overlapping with U.S. policymakers, you're, you're overlooking the fact that most of the generals were opposed to the war, and the Israeli agents in the United States, and that's what they are, they should register as foreign agents of a foreign power, we're attacking them as wimps. We're attacking them because they wouldn't follow the war precepts of the Zionists in the Pentagon. There's a whole string of military officials, conservative politicians, who are opposed to going into Iraq. And if you look at the data apart, and if you look at Cheney, Cheney was getting his information from Irving Libby, another landsman. Another member of the fraternity linked to Wolfowitz. He's a protege of Wolfowitz. I think Cheney now, if is you're looking himself. at the if, if you're trying to set up a matrix of power dealing with U.S. policy making in the Middle East, to simply say that this is shared interest without looking at the fact that the Israelis blew up a U.S. surveillance ship, killed scores of U.S. sailors, and get away with it and continue to get economic aid and the U.S. offices that were murdered by the Israeli warplanes with the U.S. flags flying over the ship and say, that's overlapping interests. That's chutzpah. That is really chutzpah. And it's very revealing that you went into a detailed explanation or purported to be explanation about the Suez that you leave out in 1967 that the Israelis are the only country in world U.S. history that bombs a U.S. warship carrying airplanes and doesn't even have to apologize and, that, and receives no retaliation from the United States. Now that's power for you. That's influence for you. 
And I Look, think to deny have, these realities... Okay, uh, is to say, can, can you know, I... Can I uh, just okay. overlapping interests. The Zionists have no power in the U.S. government. If they are Zionists, they're not tied to Israel, etc. That's a strange kind of Zionist. That don't have a okay. Um, the state of Israel. I want to ask you about uh, the, the. We have uh, only five minutes left, even less. There are a couple of things that I wanted to cover, and uh, maybe the most important one has to do with the fact that this debate, that the debate about the the, the Israel lobby in general, has broken surface uh, into the mainstream in the last, uh, let's say, year or so. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of it had to do with the Mearsheimer and Walt article. Uh, and subsequently, let's say, by the attacks on Carter's book. But uh, there were attacks before, and there were uh, uh, reviews of the role of the lobby and debates about the role of the lobby before. So, But they never made it to mainstream, and they were never, never just reviewed, let's say, by the New York Review of Books, and they were never discussed in, in um, major outlets in the United States. In fact, the Mearsheimer and Walt article originally was turned down for publication by the Atlantic magazine that had commissioned it. So maybe you can comment a little bit, the two of you, on why is it that this debate is finally breaking surface, and why is it that... Um, it is now a, a, a much more legitimate thing to debate within uh, within American I mainstream think circles. I three fast reasons. One is because of the disaster in Iraq. The public is open to a discussion, particularly with the prominence of Zionists in bringing about the war. So I think you have public opinion uh, open because of their discontent with the war and their, uh, their concern about who got us into the war and who got us into the mess. The second reason is that there's an inter-elite fight in the United States between sectors of the military, sectors of uh, Congress, conservatives, uh, with the uh, pro-Israel crowd, the pro, uh, pro-war pro crowds. And the third reason is the arrogance and bullying by the uh, Zionists and particularly their organizations that go around trying to prevent discussion has really encouraged, has backfired, and I think people are fed up with uh, the Zionists banning uh, Corey, uh, the play okay. in uh, um, New York and elsewhere. So I think James, we, we have to move on. We have a minute yes, and a ahead. half. So Norman, Sorry. could you could you say some final words? Well, I agree with the reasons. Uh, maybe I wouldn't state them quite the same way as Jim does. It's clear that Debekalov in Iraq forms the overall framework for the opening up of discussion. In my opinion, uh, that's probably not the most <laughs> uh, positive uh, result because it's going to end up in, I think, creating a scapegoat for a disastrous war by the U.S., uh, I think the second reason is that the Israeli approach, which seemed to have been successful since 67, the approach of simply applying force to every <coughs> uh, every insurgency in or every uh, br- uh, break in uh, uh, a conformity with U.S. policy, this po- this uh, policy of uh, applying overwhelming force uh, plainly is not working, and so. There are questions about the usefulness of Israel's uh, guidance and instruction in how to control the Middle East. It's, it, it's not worked in Iraq, and it proved to be a disaster in Lebanon this summer. Uh, so there's the whole question of the effectiveness of the Israeli approach, in addition to the effectiveness of Israel itself uh, as a strategic asset, which is very different than it was in 1967. Uh, and the third reason, uh, it seems to me, is that uh, Israel is becoming more and more what you might call a bloated banana republic uh, with scandals daily and this kind of squandering of resources. And uh, that being the case, uh, it's alienated large sectors of American liberal Jewish opinion. I thank you very much, James and Norman, and I think on this point of accord between you, we need to end. Thank you so very much for being here.